The good old clap, take one. That's right. How many of you knew what you wanted to be when you were seven years old? I did. I wanted to be world champion. Hey, is there honesty involved in this podcast? Can we be honest? We can shut your fucking lips. And then I'll just say, put them up once. Let's go. He's like, you look too pretty on the wave. Get ugly. We can talk about DMT if you want. Let's talk to your boxing. All right, we have Laura Enever, the pride of North Narrabeen, on today's episode <laughs> of The Lineup. Laura, thanks for joining us. Again, this is our second episode. I know, second time. Lucky me. It's pretty exciting. And, I, and I, I'm not saying the pride of North Narrabeen and Jess. That is where <laughs> me and my family lived when I was a little kid, where North Narrabeen um, would have been board riders approved. But you, you and Nathan Hedge were sort of cemented with an award recently in Narrabeen. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I know. Me and uh, me and Hoggy were both made life members of North Narrabeen Board Riders Club uh, just a couple of months ago back at our like annual board riders presentation. So it was like a huge shock for me because, you know, like I think I, I'm the first girl to be inducted in as a life member. And um, but yeah, like they, they gave Hedgie his award and we were like in tears when he did his speech and he just talked about just like the roots of the club and the history and, and what the club meant and the support and just that family, you know, that, that support that he had um, throughout his whole career. And like we were all in tears and then like, and then they like, like, okay, cool. And then, and we've got another person to be inducted. And then they said, <laughs> she, and I was like, oh my gosh. And then Chris was actually, uh, my brother was, he was on the mic and he was he was meant to you know um, call me up but he like started crying <laughs> and then it was just like all of everyone was just yeah it was very emotional. So you but, had um, no idea, like Chris didn't. Had Chris no didn't idea. Give you a hint no. or anything. And so Chris couldn't even do the speech, so he had to hand over the mic and then um, I got up and I was just like couldn't even really talk. But um, it's just like one of those moments where like it was such a, a shock and for people that don't really have a you know they're not a part of a board riders club it might sound like you know, you, you don't really un- understand, but I think just, yeah, the, the history and, and the people I was standing next to from up there with, with the North Abbey board riders, I was standing beside Damien Hardman, Simon Anderson, um, so many of the clubs, like, yeah, icons really. So it was like a, a bit of a pinch me moment. And like, I, I kind of would have thought that would have happened when I got a bit older, <laughs> but I'm 30 now. So I guess I, I was like, <laughs> all right, cool. I'm, um, I'm in the club, which is pretty cool. Well, I think we're going to dive into that a little bit more in the second segment, but it is reflective of, I think, kind of the theme with you just from the outside, which is that whether it's at a local community level or on the world stage, whether it's in sort of big wave surfing or CT surfing, whether it's behind the camera, in front of the camera, like you seem to adapt and succeed and thrive in so many situations. You've been there in Hawaii for a little bit. Um, First things first, you know, where are you at the moment? You know, who are you hanging out with? Did you surf today? What's it, what's it like? <laughs> well, I got up at 6, no, I'm at 5.45 this morning because uh, our call time for the commentary team was 6.30 down at sunset. So went down there, got, um, yeah, in the dark, first day of the waiting period, but we kind of had the feeling the event was going to be called off just looking at the forecast and the waves to come. So I actually came home and jumped back in bed for like a 15 minute power nap. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, just, I'm staying with Steph here at the moment up at sunset and they've gone off for a little surf and Steph's actually been waking up in the dark. She's very, very, um, focused and, and ready for this event. So we were up together this morning. I was like, wow, nice to see you up in the dark, darling. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, so Steph Gilmore is very excited for the event. Um, but, yeah, like I haven't left Australia in the last two years. So with COVID, everything, you know, I never, I, I didn't travel. My last surf trip was Hawaii 2019. Uh, I got to go to Jaws and then I launched my movie Undone at the start of two, 2020 and literally like the day after we did our first big premiere, COVID hit and that story for two whole years and then um yeah finally got to get over here um right after Christmas I had my flight booked but I actually got to the airport and tested positive for COVID and had to go back to my house (laughs) with all my gear like I was ready for like my two two months in Hawaii like so excited um and then yeah went back and, and did my quarantine and thankfully didn't get too sick like had a yeah a bit of a few rough days but um yeah it was 
yeah, could get the approval to fly two weeks later. And so I finally got over here on about the 10th of Jan and it means Steph actually had a, a cool little house down at, at the beach at Backdoor and, and we I saw that um, it was available when we, when COVID was happening and I was like, Steph, let's just go and like be at the beachfront for like three three weeks and just surf Backdoor and, and off the wall. And well, I love off the wall. She was very keen to surf Backdoor and pipe and just get to know the wave and and just like really put in some time there. So that was like a good three weeks of just like surfing our brains out um, before the pipe event. And then unfortunately Steph got COVID um, and had to pull out of the event at pipe. But, um, yeah, she's back now. I'm back and I'm sure hungrier than ever. When you got COVID before you came to Hawaii, was that your first time getting it? Yeah, that was my first time getting it. It, it's odd like I, I mean the amount of people that have gotten it you know multiple times and then on the other end of the spectrum there's people who have never gotten it that feel like I'm in that camp I I, totally. I don't think I've ever got it but then it's you're going like Jesus should I get it like what like what's been going on and it's just it's a total trip I know you know when when we were kicking around the idea of, of having you back on I think it was right around the time that you did arrive in Hawaii so it's maybe like mid-January or, or yeah. whenever and and it was right around the time that footage popped up on social media of you either out of back door or maybe off the wall, as you said, just sending it on yeah. a horrifying wave and getting annihilated. So my first response yeah. when someone's like, you should have Laura back on, I said, if she is still alive, absolutely, <laughs> let's get it back on. But then number two, like, super glad to see that you are. And in addition to that wave that didn't go so well, I, I personally have been like overwhelmed with clips of you just nailing barrels out at like the most dangerous stretch of sand and reef on the planet, it does seem like even though it's been a couple of years, this may already be the best season you've ever had in Hawaii just from a performance standpoint, just for you outside yeah. of the commentary stuff. No, I think so. I mean, like the last few, you know, before before COVID in the last few years I was in here, like over here in Hawaii, like I just wasn't really that focused on surfing. I kind of, you know, like I I, I kind of was only coming for like two weeks at a time then going home and then, um, yeah, I think I was – just not really putting in the time. So for me this season, like I was just so, so keen and stoked to come over and I actually just be like, let's surf my brains out, get to know these waves and like put myself amongst it. Um, but yeah, like that wave and off the wall was <laughs> that I had like my tail between my legs for a few days and like Steph had to like give me like a pep talk and be like, don't be embarrassed about like those falls. Like that was, you're, you're charging. But I was like, oh my gosh, like I don't want to, I like wanted to come over and get like be, you know, like a amazing barrel online of me, not like a crazy wipeout. But I mean, yeah, can't, can't win them all. You got to, got to give it a shot. But that was, yeah, but you've had both. One. Like I've seen, <laughs> I've seen so many good waves of you too. But also in terms of just the crazy charging that you, you've always, you've always from observedly like had a run at really big waves. But I've noticed, I think, and, and heat check me if I'm wrong, but you've got a quiver of Dylan Longbottom yeah. shapes in Hawaii this year. I don't know how many of our listeners know who Dylan Longbottom is, but he was a very formidable person in my upbringing as a surfer. Can you can you give some background on Dylan for the listeners and also just how you came to ride his boards? Yeah, totally. I think, yeah, halfway through last year, well, actually at the start of last year, I went on a, a couple of trips with Dylan and he is like one of the, the best Australian or best worldwide big wave surfers. He's known for like getting these crazy waves and um, towing at Chopes back in the day and um yeah he's just one of the all-time greats and he's you know been at Nazare and um he's shaping you know for uh Lucas Chumbo and uh Justine Dupont and like, oh, like a lot of the best big wave guys will be on Dylan's tow boards um Matahi over in Tahiti Laurie Towner um Ryan Hipwood and so like all these guys were like riding Dylan's boards and I went down on a trip to, with him last year down down the south coast of Sydney uh, to a couple of like brief breaks there and um, just tried out one of his daughter's boards and just like, yeah, was just like, wow, like just the paddle paddle power that I was getting for like from it. And um, we were just chatting about boards and I kind of like went home and, you know, like I was still, you know, after we chatted last time, last time, like I, I was in the event at Narrabeen and I was kind of like found myself on this fence that I was like, oh my gosh, like if I, maybe if I like go and just get a bunch of Dylan's and, like I could just go for it and like just properly dive into free surf and big wave 
you know, for the next couple of years. And then, um, but I was on the fence because I was like looking at this year's tour schedule as well. And like, it's so many big gnarly waves of consequence and barrels. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this is, you know, I feel like someone like Kiala also is like, well, look at the tour schedule. It's like all these waves that like, you know, I would dream to be surfing in a heat, but, um, but yeah, like the whole, uh, yeah, whether I want to be competing or free surfing is a whole different choice. So I think I was like, you just had to do some thinking and I ended up deciding to go get a bunch of Dylan boards and, and start writing for him. So I've got everything from my, um, you know, five, nine step ups for barrels and slabs up and up to my 10 O guns that I've bought over here. And, um, yeah, I've been able to ride them all so far, which has been pretty awesome. That was going to be one of my questions, though, because um, when was your last full year on the championship tour? That was 2017. And hasn't been like a long time, just it's been five years, although I suppose COVID makes it feel like several <laughs> lifetimes. But the tour in the redesign that we're seeing in 2022, kind of radically different, as you pointed out, with waves of consequence. Do you do you feel like you know, you're still charging, you're still surfing at such a high level. Do you feel like, oh, I'm not done competing. Like I may, I may want to crack at this because if I get back on the championship tour, it's actually better suited to the way I surf. Yeah, totally. Well, I think, you know, like for me, I was just like really excited to travel this year just because we haven't been, been able to the last couple of years. And then um, I have a few of my own goals this year. I'll, like, but, you know, the, the regional QS starts in, you know, a couple of months and like, I just like, can't really see myself doing them at the moment but maybe next year I mean I feel like yeah like I still feel like I'm learning in in, in like a really prime time my career with like the way like you know the, I guess the barrel riding and the, the techniques and everything that I'm learning um yeah in those waves of consequence so I mean it would it would be nice to just like jump in there but I think you know I've got so many other cool things going on right now and um I think I'll know by the time I get to the end of this year whether I'm watching all these waves. And, I mean, for now, like, even at Pipe, like, there were days where I definitely was like, oh, my God, just, like, put me out there. But I, like, I have been loving just supporting the women and, like, being someone there to just, like, cheer them on and, and um, yeah, like, hopefully I, like, can go go and, like, get back to Pipe and, you know, I'll never be probably, like, won't be able to surf with no one out, which is probably the one thing that, I want to be out there with no one out there, which is, I guess you only get that in the heat, but <laughs> competing is a whole nother thing. Like the, the different feelings you get in the heat, like, I don't know. Yeah, I guess there's the glory and everything, but um, it's, it's a hard one. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> well, I think you're so uniquely positioned and it was so awesome having you at Pipe too, because you have had a, a very, very celebrated championship tour career. You've come out, you've really pushed women surfing in waves of consequence with your film Undone and the free surfing trips you've been taking. And as you pointed out, like no one told you to go to Hawaii early and like park it at Pipe, but you did that, you know? And yeah. so having you in the lineup and it, it you know, it, everyone sort of said it, like a very historic event, having the women's first official championship tour event at Pipeline, what were some of the things you noticed um, in the lineup that were maybe different from past seasons you've been in Hawaii around women at Pipe leading up to the event? Yeah, I mean, like I, as soon as I got here, the Dehui Backdoor Shootout was happening and um, WSL had the girls team in it. And so I, like one of the maybe like fourth days I was here, got to watch uh, Moana, Kiala, Bianca and um, Bethany all just like absolutely charge at like maxing pipe. And that was just like incredible. Like I I had my own goals and I was just like so excited to watch and see how much they were pushing it out there. And um, I think that was like, you know, that was a turning point. I think since after, after that, that was like the start of January and then just seeing Moana's progression over the last few weeks, like, you know, like she has just pushed herself like above and beyond. Um, the, I think the Hui backdoor shootout was like that. That was it for her. Like those, those are the biggest barrels she'd had out pipe. Um, some of those days at like second reef, and we, me and Moana were paddling out together and sort of sitting out and um, trying to chip get get, get some chip ins. Um, and she was saying to me that this was like the biggest that she'd surfed and. By the time the pipe event rolled around, she just looked like she could do it with her eye, like she could do it with her eyes closed. She knew, knew the lineup so well, like, and um, it was amazing just watching her in the lineup out pipe. And I think that was the thing, like, 
um, you can charge so hard, but she knows that wave so well. She knows her lineups. Like she's just so in sync with that wave. It's like just crazy to watch. But um, And it must be like so radical for her being able to be in – be out at like really, really good pipeline with no one else, because I'm sure you've experienced this too, but it's like when the pack is on it and free serves, the waves that do come to people who aren't kind of, well, anyone really is like, yeah. oh my God, like no one else wanted this wave, which means it's either a dud or maybe a psycho wave that I shouldn't yeah, be, yeah. you know what I mean? Where you're, So in the back <laughs> of your head, you're like, oh no, I like, what am I doing on this wave? How come like, you know, Nate Florence didn't get it or something? Totally. Um, but it's just probably just a totally different experience being able to say, I know where to sit and there's not a hundred people around me and I just get all the waves I want. Totally. And I think that was why she was just so amazing. Like that last day, the finals day, like I did think, um, you know, Carissa could have taken it if there was more backdoor waves. But I think there was just such a, there was such a big space between where you needed to sit for the backdoor waves and the pipe waves that, um, yeah, like Carissa just like wasn't in the right position, but she's going to learn. I, I think like seeing, you know, Tyler and Carissa get those, you know, those amazing backdoor barrels. And, um, yeah, I think we're just going to see over the next few years, like a lot of the girls starting to to charge. And I think, you know, like it was, a, it was such a bummer. We didn't get to see like Tatiana go further and surf on the, those big days. And then, um, also Courtney, like I've seen her out there on some big days, um, Courtney Conlog in the lead up to the event and unfortunately went out early. But I think, you know, me and Tyler were talking about it. Like when we, like the women's first went back to Fiji to cloud break, there was like the first event we got like this eight to 10 foot swell and like none of the girls are really prepared. We were like all on these like boards that like we'd never really ridden. And then every year after that, like we just saw like, from the girls not getting barreled, taking off wide, just doing turns to like I think the third year the contest run, like Rand Cruz was getting like tens for like these amazing cloud break barrels. So I think we're just going to see that happen at, with the girls at Pipe. Like now that everyone's surfing there, like even on some of the lay days here, the girls have all just been, you know, surfing back to her again and um, in between surfing sunset. So we're just going to see more and more girls and the young girls out there. So it's it's really cool. I, I was – I was blown away by by how well everyone surfed, you know, and and there was yeah. this weird thing that happened, and I guess sort of a uh, that I observed that happened after the event or during the event too, in like a small small part of you know surf media or like surf core audience or whatever that was like very critical of the women out at Pipe yeah. and like very celebratory Moana, but also like kind of comparing and contrasting, and it to me, I'm a 38 year old white male mediocre surfer and unfortunately most of surf media is sort of in my cohort as well yeah. but it it was just odd to kind of see how loudly critical some of them were when i know for a fact that most of them wouldn't paddle out at like four foot yeah. at their home break <laughs> let alone 10 foot pipeline and i'm like it's so bizarre that there's just not like an appreciation for how well everyone's doing because whether it was lakey or tyler or carissa I was just blown away by how well they were surfing backdoor and pipe. Who was there? I get, well, I'll pause. Did you notice that as well? I guess sort of in yeah. the commentary about that. I event. noticed. I felt like there was a lot of, um, there was, everyone had their two bits to say and like whether it was positive or negative or just, you know, like questioning certain decisions and why the girls didn't run on the, on the men's final day. And it was gnarly. Like the, I feel like it's me and Steph were talking about the day after, like I came home and watched some of the replays and I was like, the waves look gnarly on the, on the camera, but like they were so like, it looks like five times as gnarly in real life. And the boys make it look so easy and Moana makes it look so easy. And even, um, like I remember being in the channel one of the days commentating and like some of the waves that the boys were going, they just like so steep, so gnarly. It's in like one foot of water and like you like, yeah, there's just certain days out there that like with the certain direction and like the thickness of it, it, it can just be like meaner and angrier and, and have more teeth. But you can't really tell like when you're watching on the camera, like it just look, looks pretty like if the light – is nice on the way but like just looks like this beautiful way but like in reality it's like super super dangerous the girls have the whole rest of the year ahead of them people have been getting more hurt in the last month than like ever like everyone's hitting everyone's like cutting and like you know the, the girls don't want to like 
break themselves going into like a really important year. But I think um, it was just, you know, that the finals day ended up being like a pretty massive day for the girls and, um, you know, they all pushed themselves and, yeah, like I, 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 I think it was an amazing um I think all, yeah, throughout the event, it was just awesome. Like Moana is a pipe specialist, but she's set the bar for all the girls now to be like, we can do that. If we put our head to it, like we can all, you know, we have the ability. We just need to have that trust and like, and go, go for it really. I, I was, it's funny you, you talked about kind of the difference between what you see on a, a webcast versus reality. And I was talking to um, Zhao Xianka about this on last week's episode where it's like, you know, growing up, it, you didn't even have a webcast. You just have a photo of this like yeah. <laughs> perfectly like, you know, pipe left and someone's just standing there. And when you're like, you're like, oh, that looks really nice. Like, I feel like if I can get barreled, it would be on that wave. Like, it looks very like you're right there. It looks like it's easy to come out, et cetera. And the reality of like going there and seeing the shifting lineup and like having to position yourself, having, you know, you know, taper your entry speed and your entry point. And it's like, oh, my God, getting to that photo point where the person's just standing tall and cruising is the the dissonance between what people think it is and what the reality is, is so, so wide. Oh, my gosh. And like the reality is like the like the reality is the boys could be riding the like seven foot boards if they wanted to and chipping in early and like making the way like a bit easier if they wanted to but like they're all riding these like tiny boards to make their drops like as critical as possible and like it's just like it's so nuts to see like the criticalness of what they're what they're doing and um and like the how dangerous it is um it's like <laughs> they're like the way the wave comes in like so fast I remember I saw Geordie take off on his wave the nine eight it must have been and I almost was like oh my god don't go like I just thought it was like too gnarly when I was watching for the chat from the channel and like they just take these like elevator like drops straight down the face and just like yeah it's just it's amazing did anyone on the on the women's side of the field um surprise you Uh, either way in the sense of I thought that surfer was going to do better or I didn't know that surfer was going to do as well yeah I think Lakey was awesome like the way that she pushed herself at, at backdoor um I think Moana just blows my mind like the way that she gets the entry into that wave um the way that she like makes it look like it's like a, a chip in I think she was riding a bigger board I think mm. some of the girls will have to go and like just re really look at their equipment I think and because Moana just looked like she was like purring into these waves making like you know but she also it was the positioning as well she knew her little chip in spot her lineup and she could, um, yeah, sort of chip into a few, but then also the way she was swooping and, like, her technique on her swoop is just, like, so amazing. Um, I knew Tyler would do well. Um, that backdoor one that she got on the finals day was sick. Like, that was, like, the highest score of the day. It was, like, the deepest sort of barrel. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, Carissa has an ama- like just amazing barrel riding technique. Um, I thought it would have been sick, yeah, to see Tatiana be be further down because I know that she would have like charged. I think Tatiana like sometimes tries to charge like too hard, and if she can like pull it back and just get her positioning right, she'll just like start nailing it out there. Because mm. um, she would like even in her heat against Moana, she like made one of the craziest drops where she like actually like does kind of what the boys does and put herself like puts herself like right under the lip to make to like have this gnarly drop lands it but then she was like too deep and the wave was just like a a crazy wave but um yeah she's if she can like refine a few things and like get her positioning in the wave selection I think she'll be awesome out there and I mean it was just a bummer that Steph couldn't surf because like the back door day like she was just like just yeah it was hard for her to watch because she was like oh my god there's like my dream you know like four five foot back door back door waves like yeah she would have been frothing. I want to get to Steph in a little bit, but oh. as we are recording on February 11th, it is Kelly Slater's oh, yeah. 50th birthday today. Happy You've been birthday to in you. The p- exactly. Yeah, I'm sure he's had <laughs> enough of that lately. I know. You had the benefit of being in the trenches throughout the entire event. And I want to put a theory across you. I was there for a bit of it, but I was not there on, I don't think I was there on the day that he, he beat Baron in the last four seconds, but put a theory past you and I want to get your read on it. When he came in and he was, you know, really, really emotional, 
my theory is that he had already resigned himself to retiring in that heat and it kind of worked out what he was going to say. And he has so much respect for Baron. And, you know, I think if he'd gone out at that stage of the event, he, he maybe would not have been super motivated to surf the rest of the events this year. And it would have been of a little bit of a torch pass to Baron. I think yeah, I have a theory yeah. that he was going to come in and say that, and he'd already kind of processed it sitting out in the water. And then, Four seconds left, he he nails that wave. And when he comes in, he was so emotional because he's going, oh, like I had already worked out kind of this like bookend in my career. Totally. And so so I'll pause there first. But what do you do you think that that theory has any merit? I mean, I think it does have some merit, but I guess you just kind of never really know with Kelly. Like I thought maybe he might just like cruise along the year, but now that they have the cutoff, he couldn't really just pick and choose, like, you know, like or right. just be able to go to Chope. So, I mean, it probably does have some merit, but um, I yeah, he was so emotional. Like after that one, that wave with Baron, like he was yes, like he shocked himself. I mean, he we're so used to seeing him do that over the years, like in so many heats where he's just pulled out the last like two second wave, gets the ten, wins the comp. Like, but I think it had been such a long time between like a moment like that, mm. and he just like. After he won that heat, like I straight up was like, "Yep, yeah, uh, uh, Kelly and Moana are going to win the contest." Sure. And um, and I like just called it. It was like he just, it was like something reignited. And um, but he's also yeah, he's been out backdoor like surfing a bunch and like piping backdoor in the lead up to the contest. And I've seen him get some like amazing waves. Yeah. And um, yeah, he just was like backdoor, backdoor and pipe king again. Like it was just, it was just incredible. It was funny on on our side, on inside the WSL too, because, you know, it, when, and I think he sort of signaled that this may be sort of a farewell season for him, but when he retires, that's going to be, you know, a 30-year chapter of surfing history, competitive surfing history that comes to a close. And so really? there are all these meetings going on about like, when's he going to do it? What's he going to do? Is he going to surf Sunset? And all the, and, and and I kind of settled on like, okay, well, if he didn't do, if he didn't say anything on the podium at Pipe, it reminded me of all those years where like kind of the late oddies, like early 2010s, where he was before the season would start. I don't know if I'm going to come back. Like, I, you know, I don't know if I'm going to do the whole year. I might be retiring from full time competition. But yeah. I, I joke with everyone at the company because I'm like, he rode for Quicksilver all those years. Quicksilver sponsored the opening event of the year on the Gold Coast. He generally did pretty good at that event. And then kind of the collective momentum of like, you got a fifth or a first or whatever it is, like go for another world title. And he'd be like, all right, I'll turn it up to bells kind of thing. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm feeling the same energy now that he's one pipe. I think in the back of his brain, he's like, why can't I be in the finals at lowers? Like totally. I actually feel like, yeah, like he, he said on, I think he said on the podium, like, or in his interviews, like I've just got some like massive thinking to do about, right. yeah, cause I think he wasn't going to come to sunset. He doesn't surf sunset like me and right, Strider yeah. were talking <laughs> doesn't about. Doesn't like it. surfing big boards. Yeah. He's like, yeah. <laughs> we were talking about it. Um, yeah, yesterday at our at our like commentary meeting, and I was like, oh, I feel like Kelly could do really good. And Strider's like, oh, he doesn't really surf here. Like he doesn't <laughs> doesn't have like. But I think like with that momentum, like just he could do. Yeah, like, I feel like he could pull anything out right now. He loves spells. Yeah, Margie's. It's just, and just never super known. turbos like in winters basically like could be like pipeline over sand like i think he's got like a good run and i think he really wants to surf g land again so it's kind of to Ooh. me it's like i think he's going to push himself through the mid-season cut that's the thing like these waves are all like barrel waves and he's one of, he's the best barrel rider one of the best it's just yeah there there is a surfer's whatsapp thread and i think one of the signals is like if kelly's like chiming in a lot on like caddy rules or what like calls or whatever it's kind of like i think he's got i think he's into it like i think he's gonna try to surf kind of thing like because he's he's clearly kind of fixated i on got taken thing. out of that chat i need to get back uh, in there yeah oh I think, you got the i think this BTS podcast access. will put you back in oh there's plenty of people in that chat that probably shouldn't be there you absolutely should yeah i was in there and then i think i um i i posted something something funny and I got taken out. <laughs> yeah, that's a <laughs> quick way to get booted. <laughs> like, there's been a lot of like, I'm going to type this and then I'm like, I better not I'll turn this down. I think I maybe posted a photo of like Renato after the Narrabeen contest and then, yeah, Jesse was like, you have been removed from the chat. 
I was like, damn it, <laughs> let me back in. <laughs> I want to hear all the goss. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's pretty good. And I need the goss now because I'm going to have a BTS show. We're going to get to that, but we're going to take a quick break to get a word in from our sponsor. And when we come back, we're going to talk about your BTS show. So we'll be right back. All right. So we're coming back from break. Right before we went to break, Laura, you mentioned your next project. Tell us what it is and when we can expect it. Yes. Well, yeah. So this year I've taken on a role on the commentary team. So I'm learning from the best there. Um, and then also on the side, I'm, I'm doing like a behind the scenes uh, tour vlog. So yeah, I'm going to be traveling around to all the stops this year and just sort of bringing some, you know, fun behind the scenes, um, you know, at the contest, contest site, lay day, lay day action and, um, yeah, just annoying all the surfers, just being in their face. <laughs> <laughs> kind like. of a yeah so it's it's something cool like we were we were chatting about it and um yeah with within the the production team and it, we just thought it could be something that could be really fun and like a, a different sort of insight um into like I guess both sides like myself doing the commentary and, and being out there and like being out in the water at like perfect 10 foot pipe and and then just seeing you know this other side to a lot of the athletes but um Pipe was a bit hard because everyone's like in their houses and like, I'm like, hello, <laughs> can I come hang out? And everyone's like, ah, uh, COVID. I'm like, oh, yeah. So the first episode, but- <laughs> you're just knocking on a bunch of doors. Like, yeah, basically. Like, hey, and they're like, I'm still the cop. I'm like, I've already had shit. COVID. I'm sweet to go. Like, come on, let me in. Let's like cook. And they're like, piss off. <laughs> no, no, no. There, there's some like, there's some good moments. We've, um, I mean, Pipe in itself was just such like a crazy, amazing contest. So it was just like, We've got some cool, cool content of everyone and wipeout sections, and yeah, it's it'll be it, it'll be fun. We're just gonna it'll be something that will just keep evolving as the um as the year, you know, evolves, and and then you know it's this year's so different with that mid year cutoff and and all the new stops. So I'm just stoked to be able to yeah be back on tour in some form, and you know, like like I said, like I'm I'm loving the the commentary role and like learning so much and just even just like being there and like even still being on the fence about like oh would I go back like I'm just learning a lot about competing and like the way everyone works and waking up earlier than I ever did on tour (laughs) (laughs) well I I was gonna actually make that comment too because going back to what we talked about at the beginning like you occupy such a unique space in surfing because you're so adaptable and you seem to succeed in, in so many ways right and I'm not trying to blow you up here but but my point is that Having someone do a behind the scenes tour vlog is made so much more interesting when it's someone like yourself who's who's doing it because you have been on the championship tour. You have been competing for CT events and for world titles. Like you are in the lineup at Backdoor and it not it that that is a pretty specific skill set that doesn't always translate to someone who can do a show or even commentate. Like there's it's a pretty small Venn diagram and um, I would imagine that your your background, and again, as you pointed out, like maybe you're going to put the jersey on at some point again too. It actually grants you access and insight into these surfers' lives that other people wouldn't have. Yeah, and I think I I think like so many of the surfers just like, and this year I'm just getting to know all the all the amazing rookies, and like I want to like share another side to everyone and and share the story, and like even just you know, see how um, I mean. Obviously, I'm I'm dealing with the box to box box guys doing their BTS show. It's just going to be a bit bigger than mine, but uh, we've been having some wars. I'm like, hey, I've got this interview. Like, <laughs> um, but, Apple uh, TV, what? Yeah. Get out of here! Uh, I'm like, hey, move over. I've got yeah, my right. WSL show here. I'll be taking over this interview. But um, no, it's just they're different, um, totally different things. <laughs> but I mean, it's just telling um, the story from I guess what I I see and. Um, yeah, like, hopefully everyone loves it. <laughs> Does it have a name? It's just the tour vlog at the moment, so keeping it pretty specific and um, yeah, to the point. Say what say what it is on the tin. Um, I'm all for that. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we'll just be going around to every event this year, and so it'll be but yeah, a bit of both, and then a lot of free surfing, lay day surfing. Um, yeah, just everyone hanging out around the contest, which will be really cool. 
You mentioned something about getting to know the rookies and both on the, the men's and the women's side this year, we have a, a lo- one of the larger rookie classes I can remember seeing of, of true rookies coming on. And on the women's side in particular, some really, really young surfers. Y- you qualified, I, I want to say when you were 18, is that right? Yeah, I qualified, yes, yeah, 17. And 17, yeah. By the time, yeah, the first World Tour rolled around, I was 18. Yeah, yeah. yeah. G- what was your experience surfing against the world's best surfers at such a young age? And and how do you think that's either similar or different to what it is now? Because you've got, you know, surfers like Betty Lucicura Johnson, I think she's 16, Luana Silva, 17. You got a bunch of young women that are joining the tour now. What have you noticed that's similar and what have you noticed that's different between when you qualified versus versus now? Yeah, I mean, it was so cool um that final at the last Challenger Series in Halieva. Um, so they hadn't had that contest for 10 years. And in the final, it was Gabby, Betty Lou, um, and Carissa. It was like three three Groms and Carissa. Who was the other one? Oh, and India, India Robinson. So, yeah, that was like a final where it was like all these younger girls and Carissa and literally 10 years before that in the last Halieva QS there, the final was myself, and this is where I qualified, myself, uh, Carissa, Coco, and Lane in the final. <laughs> I rem- I was on the beach. I totally remember this. And this is when I qualified. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, yeah, it was like just I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, like Carissa battling against, like, all these, you know, girls that are, like, 10 years younger than her have just come through and, like, just all made the final and um yeah me I think me Coco and Carissa all qualified that year um maybe Coco just done the year before but yeah like it was just it just seemed like so so wild to me watching that final and just knowing what those girls are going through like you know Betty being a bit younger um only 16 um and obviously Katie not taking her Katie Simmers not taking right. her spot I think that would have been like a really hard um sorry that would have been a really hard decision to make but um I think you know if it, she it was like a genuine I'm not I'm not ready for this and but yeah Luana I think Luana just showed that she's like so powerful and um amazing and and I think it's gonna be exciting for those girls like I actually think they're gonna um and India like they they all p- amazing power surfers have an amazing rail game um I think they're gonna like do really well on in the you know, especially here at Sunset, at Bell's Margies. Like, I think those girls are incredible power surfers. And, um, yeah, so I, I I know the feeling. Like, I feel like for they the, like all the rookies didn't really have much luck or didn't really get too many good waves at, at Backdoor and Pipe. But I think, you know, that was just such a, a new space for everyone. So hopefully they can all brush it off and um, and take a bit more confidence into into sunset but yeah most of those girls have been you know uh luana that's her home break betty like loves loves sunset as well so i think it, it'll be super exciting the the katie simmers thing that you mentioned is interesting because you know surfing as a sort of a industrial cultural phenomenon is obsessed with the cult of youth in a lot of ways yeah. and you know you see younger and younger surfers over the course of you know for the last few decades you yeah, see it right. in all sports now as well. Like all sports, there's like, you know, the Sky Browns, there's like the mm-hmm. Chloe Kims and like all these like super, super young athletes coming through and just doing like crazy things. And, um, but yeah, like the burnout is real. Like it's, it is something that you have to be so careful of. I think Steph and I were talking about it yesterday. Like I know for a fact after like, like my, but my third year on tour, I was like so burnt out. I was, I was not doing as well as I thought I'd have some really good results. And then, be on the channel like back on the QS and, right. and doing about 20 events a year and it just led to like massive burnout for me um yeah. I mean obviously if the girls can you know with that mid-year cutoff I think everyone's gonna have to get used to you know that that un, you know not qualifying like to me when I was first on tour like not qualifying seemed like the most like crazy like scary thing like on the planet and that's when you're just so wrapped up in like right. the results and stuff but I think like not qualifying is going to be like a, a thing that happens to like a lot, like a lot of people are just going to get pushed through, you know, they only have five events to, mm. and we, we might see some of the world's best surfers not qualify and then get back on the challenger series and get back on again next year. And 
um, yeah, it's just going to shake things up a lot. I think we will for sure. And I mean, it's, yeah, geez, it's it having to go through all that when you're a teenager and also in a lot of ways, both on the men's and women's side, what we've seen in the past, like not actually actually having the physical adult body to battle with, you know, your competitors in a lot of ways who might be in their mid twenties or their thirties or whatever it is. Um, and it's interesting, right? Because the industry likes to kind of pay for potential instead of achievement sometimes in the sense of like, here's this young person. It's very exciting what, what the possibility is with this person. Let's give them the big contract. And it's almost like by the time you're in your twenties or your thirties, and you're maybe winning CT events or you're winning world titles, the industry is a little bit like, ah, you know, you've kind of had yours, like, let's see who's next. Yeah, um, yeah. And, I, and I wonder, you know, with, with you looking back, qualifying at 17 and competing at 18, all things being equal, would you, would you have reconsidered kind of waiting to, to do the championship yeah. tour until you're a little bit older and maybe just had grown into like a, an, an adult body for a totally. lot of people, you know? Well, it's like, it's adult, an adult body, but also like just finding like an adult mentality as well. Right. Just like I felt so young and so oblivious and had never like had a dot of like anxiety or stress or like pressure. I was just like floating through life. Like there was no, no problems. Like I was just like so oblivious to what it felt like to have like, pretty hard stress and that was at like 16 17 and then like then you get on tour and you have the pressure and the weight and like everything you have all of a sudden everything to lose (laughs) and like if you don't know how to like if you've never done any like mental coaching like I'd I'd never even really I was was like you know I'll never deal with any of of that I'm too happy go lucky like I would just always be like if I lose it's fine whatever and then when you lose like eight contests in a row and you're just like everyone in your team and your sponsors are like what is going on and you're just like I am melting and falling apart and can't pull my shit together and sorry um no, can't fine. cannot like <laughs> can't say that on, on on the commentary you can actually but, uh, <laughs> we can say whatever we like yeah <laughs> um but yeah like it's just things can go south and then but you, yeah you have to have that team around you I think we talked about it in the last podcast but um I feel like now I'm hoping these girls and these young young crew just have have their team around team around them ready to just like bounce back really strong if they have you know a, a loss and um, yeah like I, I I hope that they are just yeah kind of prepping themselves and, and understanding that like a lot of people can have that burnout and yeah it's especially yeah with the schedule if you fall yeah fall off the CT and and then you're back on challenges it's like like eight events throughout the rest of the year then the ct starts again like a month later at the end of it so like that schedule is like pretty full on but um about to answer your question i like i actually thought when i qualified at 17 i was like oh like i'm not even legal to drink yet like i just want to like be like an 18 year old like I, i actually thought about that and like I went down and told a few friends at Narrabeen that, like, I was maybe not going to take the spot. And they were like, are you serious? Like, this is, like, <laughs> the dream. Like, I, that that's, like, crazy. And I was like, yeah, well, like, I don't know. Like, I just want to, like, live my life and, like, do some normal stuff. And then, but at the end of the day, I was like, this is an opportunity. What if I never, like, requalify again? Like, it's just, you, you just have it in front of you and you just got to run with it. And, like, I didn't finish school. I didn't have like any high school accreditation I didn't even like do my year 10 exams I was away competing doing like the pro junior series and the QS and then didn't finish high school um yeah dropped out in year 11 so I just like put all my eggs in the surf basket and then um yeah I think we had chatted about it last time as well when I started having um my like breakdown of mentality <laughs> during like <laughs> like first three years on tour I was like I'm going to be a psychologist I'm going to be my own sports psychologist I started studying like psychology whilst I was competing and then I was like oh no you just gotta go see a psychologist and, like, <laughs> so- that's what they teach all the psychologists it's like I can be my own therapist <laughs> totally yeah. yeah well I mean and I it's one of those things too that uh, 10 years ago I don't think a, this wasn't really a conversation around mental health or even sort of like mental conditioning and very few, maybe no one was doing that work. And and I think today, inside and outside of surfing, that is something that's pretty, pretty consistent. And, yeah. and also just, yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I think that what you're getting, it's an interesting topic. Like, as long as I've been employed here, which is my 17th year, 
it was so unstable for so long to your point where it's like, oh my God, if I don't take my spot on the championship tour, I don't know what the QS looks like next year. I can't yeah. rely on it even being there, having the events be the same or me being better or whatever it is. I, I have to take this opportunity where I think what Jesse Miley Dyer and the Tours and Competitions office is doing in terms of that redesign is a lot around stabilization to the point where young surfers should be able to look at these three new tiers and say, I've got confidence that to your point, it didn't work out for me in the first five events on the championship tour, but I don't, I don't fall off the planet. Yeah. You know, I'm going to go on the challengers. Exactly. I'll go on the challenger yeah. series where if I'm good enough, I'm going to be back on the CT at pipe come January, 2023. Yeah. I mean, I mean, someone like Brisa did that last year, right? Yeah. She fell off after Mexico performed on the challenger series and was back on. And I think hopefully those kind of things give athletes better like confidence and security, right? Yeah, it is. It's confidence, security, and it's like the idea of like when when I was on a falling off and having a whole year off and then coming back on, like so much, yeah, like it just it feels like when you're younger, like that is the longest time ever to like miss a year on tour or like fall off for a whole year. And then but now it's like, yeah, you can re-qualify in the same year. And I think that's that's amazing. It's tricky too. Like if you if you look at other sports, and I know it's like a big scene to compare surfing to other sports, but there is like you just look at kind of like examples right and i think if you took i did this the other day if you take steph and sally outside out of the field because they're a little bit older they're they're around 30 the average age of the ct women is 23 on tour yeah. uh, and when you look at something like the wnba the average age is around 27 or 28 yeah, yeah. and a lot of these other sports have kind of built-in maturation systems in a way where it's like you know, the NFL is about, not, maybe not the best example, but like you have to kind of go through the NCAA system to get to the NFL. And I don't think anyone's Pollyanna-ish enough to think that like every NFL player is going to class and earning their degree and all that stuff. But even if they're not, it's still four years of having to grow up, of having to like interact with other people before you hit the elite level. And surfing's just never had that, you know, like you're, as you pointed out, you're like, I'm 17. I best, I guess I'm I'm competing for world title now. Like that's where we're at kind of thing. Totally. I know. I think, um, yeah, I think you know, hit the nail on the head there. It's just like you you have it right in front of you. You just like I, like those girls, like Betty and Luana, that was like their first shot at like doing the QS and that was kind of how it was for like, you know, I, I feel like every five years we're seeing, like every few years we're just seeing this like group of young girls and it was like at the time it was like me. Myself, Coco, Malia, Carissa, Tyler, um, Sal, and like we all got on quite young. Like we were all doing it young. And so I think that's the same thing as these young girls. They're like, you know, the yeah, Betty, I'm sure Katie will be the next year. It's like they've got a new crew of like really young girls um, that'll be you know, doing it together and like having their back and having that support. It's like, you know, being that same age group and um, going through it all together and like hopefully supporting and like being able to open up when things are you know, not going the way they planned and, and, you know, keep, yeah, supporting each other, I guess. It's tricky. And I want to, I want to get your insight on this too, though, right? Because I think you're totally right. Like both on the men's and the women's tours, yeah. it cycles where you get sort of a generational shift of like, okay, this new class is coming in. It's so wild on the men's side to be like, all of a sudden, like, Geordie and oh, obviously Kelly, the 50 year old. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> other than that, it's like Geordie and Owen are like the oldest crew like it's right. just um yeah like and then now it's it's you know the the mid 20 year olds like mid to late 20 year olds are all there and then there's now the young crew coming through like on the rookie side it, it's tr it's tricky though like because uh, the insight i want to get from you though is not as young on the men's side though i think so, sometimes you get it though and obviously like the surfing industrial complex has a lot of hype around what we talked about like young people qualifying but when when it's men or women they're qualifying at whatever 16 17 18 around that space and it's super exciting and for sure it's going to push the level of surfing i still look at some of these young women that have qualified and i think in my head i'm like okay like are what's going to happen when they come up against a fully powered Carissa Moore or Stephanie Gilmore. And I'm like, man, I still think there's a huge gap in, in terms of ability. And I'm, I'm interested to get your read on that. Maybe I'm reading it wrong. But, well, I, I yeah. actually think that this year's rookies between like, so I guess when I qualified, I, other than getting my Halle Eva event, like most of the waves that I qualified in were like one foot and like, right. 
pretty small and like I'm like a small build girl like I actually would beat all the you know stronger girls when it was small because I could just be like whippy and fast and um I think it's kind of different with this year's rookies because like you know Luana uh Gabby um Betty Lou and India all did their work at both Huntington and then at Irisira and then at Halle Eva when it was like big like they actually have a lot of power like like Betty Lou the way that she like turns her boards and throws her spray like I think she's going to do like amazing and all the powerful waves and all the Hawaii like Hawaii girls are um yeah they're powerful they know how to ride big boards like I think that they're going to do really well at like the Margies the Bells Sunset um because that was like their their power and same with India like she's an amazing power surfer so I think they're going to have the power they and then maybe not the progression like that Carissa's we're seeing from Carissa and so I think I don't know. I feel like they could they could ruffle some feathers for sure. I think that's a good note. And I think that's actually kind of another testament to the redesign a little bit because of the the Challenger series is intended to be in sort of elevated waves as much as possible. So you're kind of getting the, the surfers that matriculate through that, as you pointed out, have had to prove themselves in sort of waves that are closer to the championship tour. Yeah. And I think that's why Katie maybe like – you know, established that she was like, I did really well in um, at Huntington. She was flaring. She has that flair. She has that like progressive side of her surfing. But then, she, obviously, like at Irisira and um, and Haleiwa, she probably noticed that she didn't have the power because she's so small. Like she's fifteen. Like, yeah. and she was probably so shocked that she she got there and was like, Yeah, I think she made a really good call. She's gonna just be able to grow, develop, be like a young kid for a couple more years, and then. And kind of like Carissa, Carissa like could have qualified. She was like one of the best in the world at 14 and she decided to, you know, back off, go to school, finish school and jump on when she was 18, 19 mm. and then came on like so, like she and she's had such a long career, like the longevity in, in Carissa's career has been amazing. And and Steph was talking about it yesterday as well. Um, like she finished school. I was like, weren't you on two when you were like 12? She was like, no. She was like, I like won a wild card at 17. But she's like, I went to school and was like, and I finished school and jumped on when I was 19. Or yeah. So she, she got on two when she was 19. Um, but yeah. So I think she has, yeah, we were having the same conversation though. Like just that's the age. Um, I think Katie made a really good, good call and like I'm proud of her for doing that. It's it's rad. I was like, have a fun year just surfing and cruising and then maybe she will do the Challenger Series. Maybe she might take a couple of years off like and just keep free surfing because she could jump on the tour when she's 18 and or 19 and be like one of the best air girls in the world. It's like. Totally. Yeah. And, I, and it's such a good point you bring up about Steph who is in the conversation for being, you know, one of the greatest of all time, if not the greatest of all time. Um, as silly as it sounds, like comparatively kind of joined the tour late compared to a lot yeah, of people, you know, at she 19, did. she finished school, which, which is interesting. we got a couple more topics we're going to get to and some listener questions for you, but we're going to take one more break to get a word from our sponsors back in. And when we come back, we will talk about it all. So let's bring it back to you and your surfing, Laura, because I want to get your honest opinion. You mentioned you're 30 years old. Do you think that you're doing the best surfing of your life right now? I actually, I don't in like performance terms, but I do in like the way that I'm reading waves and like in, criti in critical waves of consequence. Like it's like two different types of surfing to me. Like I've probably abandoned my like turns and cars and um, progression in that sense, but like my eyes are just like, I'm like goo goo gaga at getting big barrels <laughs> and like I just like want to get the biggest barrels and like I just for me there's no better feeling and I want to like be able to like make those critical drops and be taking off in the critical part and and focus on paddle surfing and and paddling in um and not towing so like yeah even being able to go to the outer reefs I, I had um I actually had Alex Gray come over and um he was like mentoring me uh, at the start of they just we were just surfing together and he's you know surfs gets some amazing waves and off the wall and so we were just like surfing there and then we went and surfed some of the outer reefs and um like I got invited to the Jaws the Jaws event this year and it was kind of like when I got the invite 
like, oh my gosh, like I've just been at home the last two years. Like I haven't even ridden a big board. Mm. I haven't been able to go train. And I was like probably like back when I was 2019, I was like so ready for that event. So for this this year for me to come over here was like, let's just get your feet back in the wax, go charge. Um, to be honest, like I paddled out the outer reef um, like a few weeks ago and got out there and was like, oh, God, everything feels bigger than I remember. Like <laughs> big wave surfing is bigger. <laughs> um, I was like, these waves are pretty big. And they're like, you know, it wasn't Jaws or anything, but I was like, oh, gosh, heart was pumping. And I was like, God, do you like really love this? And I was like sitting out there having like a conversation with myself and I was like, let's just get a – a shoulder hopper to start and then after that I was like it just all clicked and I was like let's go get a bigger one then I was like let's get a bigger one and could have sat out there all day but um I'm I'm like hooked on it again so (laughs) but do you think that your experience at the outer reefs in sort of radical conditions critical waves that experience and how you're learning to read water do you think that that translates to your performance surfing at some point? And I'll give you a crappy uh, comparison because what you surf is nothing like what I surf, but just on the tiniest <laughs> of fractions, you know, if I go to Hawaii and I surf out at Sunset Beach and it's like slightly overhead and I stay for a couple of weeks and I surf slightly overhead Sunset Beach, which is probably three foot Hawaiian, I come home to my little beach break and I'm like, I'm full of confidence. I feel like I understand how water moves a little bit better. Like totally. I, I'd imagine that there is something <laughs> that does translate, even though you say like, oh, like, you know, maybe my performance surfing isn't what it used to be, but it might actually be better. Like if you, yeah. you know, in a way, I, mean, that's, I, haven't, that's theory. I haven't really given it much like breath to totally notice. Cause I've just been like, I've kind of just been surfing like twenties and stuff when it's a bit smaller and stuff. Right. But um, yeah, definitely when you surf like a 15 foot wave, you go back to a, a three foot wave and that like gnarly three foot floater or like like end section feels like nothing <laughs> you're like oh this right. is like the easiest thing ever but um uh, so yeah you have a whole new like yeah look at the wave and that's probably why you see john john doing like a crazy air on like a four foot wave i'm like most people wouldn't even want to like do a floater or like a whitewater tap on that thing and like he's just doing like these huge airs on like huge sections because they feel small. <laughs> I, I remember talking to Kolohe about this last year and we brought that up and he's like, you know, like the wave that formed me, was like T street lowers. Right. And he goes, the wave that formed Jack Robinson is like the box and North point yeah. and John is pipeline. And he goes, it's just a different thing. You know, the, the translation and what they read in the water and critical waves and how you apply that. Now, obviously you can work very hard in both directions to, you know, if you grew up at North Point, you're like, oh, I learn how to surf a beach break. And if you grew up at T Street, you're like, I learn how to surf pipe sort of thing. But like, totally, it, it does feel like it, it does translate in an interesting way. Yeah, I think it does. Like you find this whole new confidence and that's, what I think it is for me. It's like, it's just, it's confidence and it's like, yeah, thrilling and exciting. And, and um, like, I'm super, yeah obsessed with (laughs) it's like an obsessive thing but um I'm kind of like it's kind of good like I know I know when to switch it on on and off and like you know even with this new the new commentary job as well like it's it's kind of good I I like surf my brains out for like three weeks and I was like oh I'm a bit like tired the the waves have been pumping the whole time here but um yeah I think for me it's just you know I have my own goals for this year and like excited to yeah, hit them and then and then I, I would probably want to be like, yeah, let's see if I can translate this into turns and, and where my turns are at now. And, like, that's when I'll probably really be able to know at the end of the year if I could could get back on tour. Because, like, Thanks. you could jump on tour now and just be, like, a barrel specialist or, like, a gnarly wave specialist. But then, yeah, like, if you're not there with the turns up, like, if your turns aren't up to scratch with the other girls, then... I, I, I mean, I guess that's fair, but I always think that like, there's always room to improve, you know, and this yeah, comes up a exactly. lot on this podcast where, and, and I think we probably talked about it too, where it's like, again, because of all the hype that goes into young surfers qualifying, a lot of them qualify and they're like, I've reached the top. This is as good as I ever need to be. All these magazines, well, like Instagram say so. So I'm done. Whereas you look at surfers like Mick Fanning or Adriana D'Souza or Steph and, and they get to the tour and they're like, I'm pretty good, but I have a lot to learn. And I remember like when John qualified and, you know, he grew up under one of the more intense spotlights ever. And when he qualified, the general consensus around the tour was like, well, I hope he does well enough to like make it at pipe. And 
I think he he's like on the record as being like, oh yeah, no, I had to do a lot of work on my turns and errors. And now you see what he does out of like rock piles and stuff. And you're like, you're redefining what people can do in turns broadly because of that background. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it's, yeah, it is like, like you're saying, it's, it's where everyone grows up. It's, um, it's like Felipe is just so amazing. And then he's had to prove himself in these bigger waves. And it's like, it, you know, like on a normal day out pipe, like, it's pipe specialists out there like the mm. people that surf these waves like it's kind of like the same as everywhere like all barreling waves around the world there's like these people that are just like they don't even probably have many boards that they do turns on they're just like i like want to just get these big barrels and like i'll focus all my time and energy like on like getting these the barrel of, like the winter um mm. they don't even want to bar like the other waves but uh that's what makes these tour surfers so amazing and versatile and like what they're doing now and, and you know, pushing themselves at pipe and being so versatile is, is pretty cool to see. And like I loved I loved watching like, you know, there was so many of the men on that first day at pipe that like they all just charged so hard. Like right. giving them that opportunity to go out and just like have perfect pipe in like round one of the event. Like there's so many of those surfers that you would never get to see um because usually the i feel like the pumping day would always be on finals day but to have right. like that perfect pipe for all of those like underground guys that would like never get away like the connor o'leary's you know jacko baker's um yeah. jail even just having those opportunities like um sammy sammy pupo like was so sick to see him like and, and all of them just like what you can do if you have that opportunity I feel like the Poopo brothers in particular, I feel like their resting heart rate at 12 foot pipeline is probably what mine is when I'm having a nap. Like they're just so like, <laughs> know. Uh, you know, like it's so like, you know, oh like, man, gosh. that's like a superpower watching you guys surf. I know. I was having the funny, like I, I got this like awesome video of um, Sammy just like having a donut before his heat. Like, <laughs> and then like Miggy was down there and they, he was like supporting Sammy in the quarterfinal and then the men's semis got pushed forward and he was just like cruising on up like anyone else would have been like scrambling and he was just like Rrr. like they're just so chill it's so cool and like I love this and I love that there's like a brother dynamic on tour it's sick we just had the first women's championship tour event at pipeline this is dropping we're actually recording day one of the window we're not on today but this is going to be dropping probably after we've ran at least the opening day at Sunset Beach and Sunset Beach has been a staple of the women's tour since its inaugural year in 1977. It is a wave that women have performed so well at in the past, whether it's Lynn Boyer or Lane Beachley, you know, Sophia Milanovic, uh, you know, yeah. Tyler Wright, you know, Carissa, staff, et cetera. Yeah. What are your predictions for the event coming up on the women's side? Yeah, I think, I think that Carissa is going to be hard to beat. Um, I'm super interested to see what like Moana takes from from mm. Pipe to Sunset. Um, that's like a whole conversation itself, like with poli- like qualification at the end of um, sure. the five events. Like, um, so it'll be cool to see that unravel. Um, but uh, Steph, I feel like she's just jumped on some Takoras and she's like loving them, feeling really confident. Um, yeah, like someone like Bronte McCauley as well could come out of the gates flying. The backside girls could do amazing, like doing some like really critical um, like in the pocket surfing. So, and Tatiana, I think, will be um, hard to beat too. You mentioned Steph and obviously we talked about, you know, how frustrating it must have been for her to be in a COVID protocol and not get to compete at Pipe. Mentally, since you two are obviously very close, you'll still be staying together. How do you think she is mentally heading into Sunset Beach? Is she just like chomping at the bit? Is she calm? Is she a little bit deflated? Like how do you kind of see her heading into Sunset Beach? Yeah, I think it was like a hard, like really hard time for her to miss, miss Pipe and then, um, yeah, get just have to sit it out and watch in such like a historic moment. Um, yeah, I had yeah, she was definitely – very rattled and like she even like had moments where she was like oh like I could tell she was like do I just like not do the year like you Mm. you get one throwaway now but like she's in a position where she's got um last place or a zero like throwaway she she doesn't have any room to really um Mm. have any bad results now but I watched that quickly turn from like deflation into like a lot of 
you know, she just started surfing the sunset every day. And as soon as she could could surf, she's just been out there every morning and putting in the time and, and trying her boards. And um, I've just seen her get more and more confident every day. And then when she jumped on these new boards the other day, she was like, She's hard, like she doesn't want to give away much because she's still right, so yeah. like yeah, she's so chill. But um, yeah, she seemed like really stoked and excited. I, I feel like the the media around that that narrative in particular, because we've got this influx of young women on tour, are so quick to kind of prejudge. Like Steph's had her time; she's ready to kind of be put out to pasture. And I'm like, man, I've been here for so long, and I've seen this up close. I really think she's surfing better than ever. I and again, too. kind of, yeah. and, and, and similar to what we were saying before, it's like the young women coming on tour are so amazing, but they just, to me, they have a long way to go before they could even think about challenging a full powered Steph Gilmore. So yeah. I would like to see her come back and just no holds bar. I think she's got more world titles in her and I'm excited about yeah. that. I just think that like her forehand card is like one of the most like smooth, like well-timed, beautiful, bits of art <laughs> and um yeah so I think that you know like some of these other girls like the Bettys and they might have the flair and throw a lot of spray but I think like Steph's precise timing and everything and um yeah if she can get the waves and beat in the headspace I think she's still going to be hard to beat like she still wants it like we saw her at Mexico last year just like mm. just surf like incredible and so she's got a lot of rights to go well she's got a, a lot of rights in the first half of the year to um yeah do some damage there and then you know she's yeah gonna have to turn her on the lefts in the second half <laughs> <laughs> well and you, you we've got jay bay punta roca oh, in yeah, the back jay half bay, like punta i roca, you know yeah. like yeah and funny enough like she was she, i think she god i want to i'm gonna probably screw this up i think she won the first event we had in peru back in the day when we went yeah, to the left yeah. and it's like everyone's like oh steph won in, on her backhand kind of thing and, and it's like I, she can surf she's an amazing surfer it's just there's so many of those gold coast surfers who have such a strong forehand that they're like oh people are like i can't surf on their backhand it's like no they're still pretty good no they're still good in their backhand she's been yeah. surfing rocky lefts a lot too mm. <laughs> That's good times. That's good times. Um, yeah. Well, we did mention we put out a feeler to the Instagram community, and you were very popular because we got uh, hundreds of questions back, but oh, we whittled cool. it down to three for, for time's sake. The first question is from at live underscore sims10, who asks, what wave has challenged you the most? Oh, I think probably, yeah, pipe and pipe back door off the wall. Um, just like the crowd finding you're like some days you'll sit out there for like hours and hours and you just have to like you know you see these highlight reels of like so many surfers and you're like oh my gosh they got so many waves that day and like the reality is like they probably surfed like for six to eight hours and got like six waves um like four they, waves. they all say that even the best they're yeah. like oh i spent eight hours out here and got four waves it was a success i'm like was it i don't have eight hours to spend out there that's crazy some days even just like taking off and like having a nice job and pulling in and not making it it's like oh success I actually got a wave amongst the crowd but um <laughs> yeah that was like my successes I was like oh my god like the the drop or whatever um but yeah like just learning how to paddle in when you have like a big wall of water coming at you moving really fast on shallow reef like and turning and going and getting yourself in position and and the timing and and everything that's been like a really big amazing scary challenge for me but um yeah, obviously end in, in me getting exploded a couple of times. But, uh, yeah, like when you go from like, I think for me, like I had that like crazy wide pad off the wall, have to like pop it up or something. Well, I don't know, we can do that. But <laughs> then a few <laughs> days later it took me a while to just like wipe the cobwebs off and be like, let's try again. And then I like finally got a wave like almost as big and had a nice big drop and, and got like a big bow. So it was like just when you have those like knockdowns and then like get back out and, and try again and have like a success, it's it's pretty awesome. I think that's a great answer. Sometimes for me, it's not, I've, even if I don't catch a wave, but I'm like, well, I, I put myself in position and there were three guys that were in better position, but I was close. So I call that a success, you know? Yeah. Something that I was telling a lot of the girls at Pipe was like a lot of them, you know, hadn't paddled out on a big day where they'd kind of write themselves off and think, like, I just won't get a wave along, like, amongst there. Like, I've never even caught a wave in that in those bigger waves. But I think still paddling out, although it's probably not good for the amount of people out there, but, like, just to be, like, even sitting in the channel or sitting in the lineup wide and, like, identifying exactly where the best guys at Pike were, like, catching their waves. Like, I think that's, like, a something that is 
yeah, like it's just a really good way to like find, like work out the lineup. That's great advice. Mm -hmm. Second question is from at Yancey73 who asks, is Laura going to do another East Coast USA trip again? We would love to see her surf while in Virginia. Yeah, that'd be fun. I mean, I'm like so excited to travel this year. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> everywhere, take me We're anywhere, kind of, yeah. everywhere. <laughs> like two years of like gardening and cuddling my puppy. I'm like, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, pup. We'll see you later. I know. I miss my dog. <laughs> that that's, happens. Last question is from at Melinda Sims, who asks, which event would you like a wild card at this year? Assuming it wasn't pipe or sunset. Yeah. Oh, I would love to get a wild card into Chopes. But mm. um or G Land. Chopes or G Land. I mean, I love Lefts. I grew up in Have you, have you been to G Land like, before? I've never been to G Land, but Left Barrel, love it. <laughs> I, I like actually it. like feel more confident almost going um left and getting tubed. Like I love like the the drop and the pig dog and trying to swoop under it. But um yeah, and I just love, I love this because I'm from Narrabeen. <laughs> Fair point. Final segment, and we've done this before, but I don't remember your answers. We can compare and contrast. It is time for the lightning round. So we've got 10 questions oh, yeah. for you to answer as quickly as you can. First question. If you could only have one board set up for the rest of your life, single fin, twin fin, thruster, quad bonzer, or finless, which would you choose? Thruster. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Burrito or pizza? Burrito. Last book you read? Oh, man. Spent a long time between books. <laughs> oh, like, actually, the commentary Bible for Sunset. <laughs> yeah, that is a book. That's actually <laughs> bigger than most books. Shout out to Chad Weber, <laughs> Milby Shannon, yeah. Jed Pearson. Oh, my God. They're the, the production best. Team. All the production team are the best. <laughs> best surf film ever? <sighs> Gosh, it's a really hard one. There's been so many goodies. I don't know. I like really loved Three Degrees. Uh, no, sorry, mm. Endless Summer 2 was like my all-time favourite movie. I watched it like every Friday night with my dad. I just like <laughs> couldn't believe how good TJ Barron surfed when he was like four years old. <laughs> I know. I, th I feel like I, th I don't remember how old I was when I watched it, but I, it would have been older. And I feel like everyone that watched it when they're older, they're just like... <sighs> I was yeah. doing that at four, so it's not happening. I know. Yeah. <laughs> but that movie actually like petrified me from going to Fiji because there was they like had the right. sea snake, and I was like, yes. "Oh my gosh, I'm never going there. The place is crazy." I've never and they seen ramped it. up how scary it was yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. They're like, They're like oh, "You this could is die. Like, you could I'm die." Like, I'm from the rock music <laughs> and Tom Carroll, and I'm like, "Well, you know." And like we live in Australia and it's like we've got snakes everywhere that keep getting right. and like yeah, spiders right. every day. And I was like, Fiji is the most dangerous place on the planet. And I think that was a little bit of like a coming out for Kelly too, because he wasn't in the film, but he was in the Fiji segment. He like picked up the yeah. snake and everyone's like, Kelly is radical. Like that. it's like, okay. So good. One wave you never have to go back to. The first thing that came to my mind was the right. <laughs> Fair WA, <laughs> but <laughs> but to be honest, like I kind of want to go back and just like get one wave because I had like just such a it was like it, it beat me mentally that wave. So I was like, because it beat me, I'm like I have to go back and like just right. try like work it out or get one or like just yeah, just Makes go sense. back and watch even. Right, got to process it so you can sleep well at night. Yeah, if you only get to surf one wave for the rest of your life. Oh, I was going to say cloud break, but I feel like my hips would get sort of going left all day forever. There's a, I guess like, oh, I don't know. That's such a hard one. What do other people say to that? <laughs> oh, a lot. There's a lot like of like lovers. local, like local breaks, you know, there's a lot of like dream casting. They're like, well, if I could surf like, you know, Kira back in the nineties when nobody would be that way sort of stuff. But yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, I would love to surf cloud break. My, the rest of my life I could just like pop it in like a little like wave pool <laughs> that's perfect <laughs> no let's go to Fiji best person to share a lineup with Steph Gilmore Steph and Coco it's mm. Steph Coco and Mason <laughs> <laughs> that's fair <laughs> those are good conversations worst person to share a lineup with I don't know I don't like 
I don't like throwing anyone under the bus. It's all right. You don't have to. You can you can say that you have an answer, but you don't say it. That happens. Maybe a lot. like maybe like a goat voter. I don't uh, know. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. All right, last one. Finish this sentence. I will next achieve a state of happiness by. I will next achieve a state of happiness by not doing the dishes mm. ever again. Mm. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Laura Annever, thank you so much for coming back on the lineup. Everyone, by the time this drops, maybe the tour vlog has dropped. If not, it will be yeah. imminent. I cannot wait to watch that. I'll see you in Hawaii in a few days. And uh, I can't oh, wait yes, to watch sick. you on the commentary for the entire season. We're so fortunate. Thanks I know. for coming back on. I actually did like a terrible stutter at Pipe. I was like, <laughs> Moana sits out here for s -s 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 -s. it actually sounded like there was like a deep a like glitch. A, someone, yeah. yeah, a glitch. <laughs> right, and I was yeah. like so thankful, but now you all know I totally stuttered. I was like, Bleh. so hopefully no no more of that. Well, I I we're very fortunate to have you do what you do, especially <laughs> with your insights. So can't wait for more of it. And um yeah, thanks for coming back on. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Legend. Chat soon. <laughs>